better than the great Pierre C. Carpenter. Cycling, men and women sprints, the best in the world gunning for a spot in the semifinals. And yachting, day three of competition, a breezy one for the American women. And you'll see Evan's spectacular finish, out kicking Heike Friedrich to shatter her own world record by more than a second and a half. Plus more as the games of the 24th Olympiad continue. It's Friday morning and about an hour before dawn here in Seoul, Korea. You are once again looking at the beautiful Han River. And good afternoon to all of you in the United States. I'm Ahmad Rashad and welcome back to NBC's Olympic coverage. With rare exception, gold medal winners at the Olympics are considered the best in the world at what they do. That makes a standout in multiple events, a Matt Biondi or a Carl Lewis, that much more remarkable. But there have been a couple of athletes in Olympic history who've gone a step further bridging the gap between winter and summer games. One was an American named Eddie Egan who won boxing and bobsledding medals 12 years apart in the 20s and the 30s. The other was Jacob Tullin Toms, a Norwegian who won a gold in ski jumping in 1924 and a silver in yachting in 1936. That's been it until now, but today we're going to get our first look at a woman who is attempting to do both these guys one better and win summer and winter gold medals in the same year. We'll be back with that in a moment. NBC Sports presents the Games of the 24th Olympiad, brought to you by the heartbeat of America, today Chevrolet, by Miller Brewing Company, sole sponsor of the U.S. Olympic Training Centers, by TCBY, frozen yogurt. Say goodbye to high calories with the delicious taste of TCBY frozen yogurt. And by Goodyear Certified Auto Service. Nobody fits you like Goodyear. Luding is a speed skater who won a gold medal in Calgary earlier this year in the 1,000 meters. She's also a cyclist with a pretty good chance to strike gold over the same distance. However, she'll have to beat out American Connie Young, a three-time world champion who advanced to the semifinals yesterday by beating China's Zhu Ying Zhao in two straight races to win her heat. This is the first time women's sprint cycling has appeared in Olympics, so there are no past records to consult but Rotenberger, Luging, and Young are considered good bets to medal and among the favorites for the gold. Let's go to cycling and Gary Gerald for the second race in week. Once again at the Olympic Park Velodrome, women's sprint quarterfinal activities. Let's check the lineup now for this pairing, the second in the best of three series between Krista Rothenberger Luding against Julie Spate. Spate from Australia, while Rothenberger Luding, who leads the series, one to nothing, is from the German Democratic Republic. Krista Rothenberger Luding had to post the fastest time in this round to defeat Julie Spate. Julie is very fast. There's a good look at the former world champion in match sprinting and a gold and silver medalist in the Winter Games. She had to go as fast, almost as fast as she was capable of in order to defeat Julie Spate from Australia in their first match. She did so, however, and needs to win but once more to advance to the semifinal round. Then are the alternate, uh, or the uh, alternate way of starting. This time it is uh, Rothenberger Luding who sets the pace. She's the first one to lead out now, and Julie Spate follows. In that first ride, Julie Spate came up with a very impressive comeback effort because it looked like uh, Krista had things well in hand, but Spate made it very interesting at the finish. Well, Julie Spade is young, but she's really committed to the sport of bicycle racing and to match sprinting in particular. She spent most of the summer north of the equator in the United States racing against, among others, Connie Young. So she's gathered a lot of experience in her short career, and uh, she's used it well thus far. She came very close 
uh, in her race against Krista Rothenberger looting the first time around. Rothenberger looting now has the lead as she has since they pulled away from the line coming off the banking here out of the front straightaway to complete the opening lap. You can feel the tension. You can see the tension these riders feel. They know that this is such an explosive sport that while they may appear to be just sort of riding casually around the track, the, the move can come at any time. We've seen it happen suddenly. We've seen things happen dramatically. And, and neither rider can afford to relax as they appear to be right now. And you have to be able to react to that move almost instantly. Otherwise, it, it may be all over. It, indeed, indeed, it will be. The high banking makes a move, a sudden move. It magnifies a sudden move. You're able to accelerate on flat ground at a certain speed, but by diving off that banking, you can accelerate much quicker and open a larger gap in a short period of time. We're beyond the midway point of the second lap now, and it's still Krista Ruffenberger looting who holds the advantage now, looking back over her shoulder, trying to know precisely where Julie Spade is. We hear the bell, and now the tempo will begin to pick up as they cross the line with just one lap to go, and the possibility that Ruffenberger looting will be able to advance to the semifinals. Now, Julie Spade dances out of the saddle and forces Krista Rottenberger looting to do the same thing. This is a perfect distance that Julie Spade has left, and if Rottenberger looting leads her out, by that I mean commits to the finish, line Julie Spate could make a successful run at her let's see all right here they come off the bank once again Spate trying to make the move unable to do so and the pure power of Krista Rothenberger looting the woman who won two medals at Calgary in speed skating hoping to do the same here in cycling manages to put away her Australian foe in consecutive rides so she will advance as well to the semifinal round There's little argument over the identity of the best male sprint cyclists here. You see, the two best in the world by far are both East Germans, and each country can only be represented once. Lutz Hesslick won the 1980 gold medal in this event and is a four-time world champ. Let's pick up his quarterfile heat now with Gary Gerald. At the Olympic Park Velodrome with Brian Drebber, I'm Gary Gerald. We set up now for a quarterfinal activity in the men's sprints. The match sprint is three laps, Gary, and the riders drew for position in their first ride. They reversed for this ride, and the first lap will proceed at a minimum of walking pace. The last lap is time for the final 200 meters in this best of three series. This is the second ride now for Lutz Hesslick going against Frank Weber, and this uh, is a battle between the German Democratic Republic and the Federal Republic of Germany, the West German being uh, Frank Weber, and Hesslick, of course, the defending world champion, a former Olympic champion who easily won the first round is the East German, and he will start on the uh, high side of the track for this particular test. So Frank Weber down at the bottom in the white jersey of the Federal Republic of Germany in this all-German quarterfinal will lead the first lap at a minimum of walking pace. He's rolled out there really unconcerned about what Heslick is going to do. Heslick is equally unconcerned about this first lap. It is only that last lap, if we can read what they did the first time around, that's going to amount to anything, as, as Heslick simply led out uh, Frank Weber and showed him what 10.6 seconds <laughs> looks like, and Weber was not able to match that. It was emphatic to say the least. You talk about sprint dominance, the East Germans have been a juggernaut in recent years in world championship competition, in fact, sweeping the top four spots the last two years, but they can only put one rider in the Olympics in this event, and that man is Heslick. He's clearly the best. And so Weber becomes the long shot who must win here to keep his Olympic hopes alive. If he loses this head-to-head -head meeting, he's out, and it will be Heslick advancing to the semifinal or to the uh, semifinal round, yes. Well, Lutz Heslick has exhibited a little bit of cockiness, but I think it's actually certainly justified. He says that winning the Olympic gold medal has to be easier than winning the world championships and even the national championships in the uh, German Democratic Republic. The best four sprinters in the world are from the same country, and he is but one of that, uh, of that pile of four that are the best in the world. Now we look at some real tactics here as we've come to a track stand, and this is interesting because Weber, who has the front spot, wants to ride from behind. And look at both men drawing the applause of the crowd now at the Olympic Park Velodrome, perfectly balanced on their machines just across the start-finish line. One lap completed and two to go. This is amazing to watch. This is a battle of nerves here, and the man with the nerves of steel is Lewis Hesley. And he is right. You can see how relaxed he is. He's just concentrating on keeping a balance. And Weber is in front of him, so it's easy for him to watch what Weber is going to do. This, uh, they will do this 
for as long as it takes if Weber is determined to want the back position and Heslick is equally determined to stay there it could go on forever but it does not Weber says well okay you've proved the point well maybe we're going to try it again well they're in a steeper part of the track right now and it's gonna I my heart moves up a couple of notches in my chest when I see him try to start to balance on the steeper part of the track that's just past the finish line because you can lose traction very suddenly and bingo you're down so the battle of wills goes to Heslick at least for the moment. We'll see. It'll be interesting to see if Weber decides he wants to try it again at some point. Well, I'm surprised that he wants the back position. He lost from the back the first time around. So I'm not certain why he would elect to try to go to where he lost uh, before. But uh, he's the one riding on the track, and we are observers at this point. Midway through the second lap, and after that track stand, they've now picked up a, a rolling pace as they move high on the banking at the opposite end of the track from our commentary position Lutz Heslick in 1980 the gold medalist in uh, Moscow didn't get a chance to compete in Los Angeles in 84 and he is just watching every move now the West German Frank Weber well there's not going to be any more slow tactics or any more track stands at the final lap of the race it really must go up to speed the tactics change from low speed tactics which we've seen a little bit of to high speed tactics we'll watch carefully here as Weber leads out Heslick reversed from the way they were the first time around and watch Heslick he's not unlike a locomotive as he begins to pour on the power they come to the final turn and here he comes but look at Weber respond now Heslick takes the command and he gets the win by about a foot and a half so they kind of swap positions momentarily when it looked like Heslick was going to be in command. It wasn't quite as definite as we thought. Well, Heslick does a great job of, of exhibiting a little bit of patience. He doesn't start to pass until they're in the straightaway, and the distance to the finish line is equal for both riders. Here it's power against power, and Heslick has more power than Weber at this point. So it's a 2-0 ride. Heslick acknowledges the... Applause here from the crowd on the velodrome, and as expected, he advances to semifinal competition in the men's match sprint. When we return, a man who's been winning Olympic medals since just before all these athletes were born. First, these words from your local stations. We're going to meet a man who won his first gold medal more than 40 years ago at the 1948 Olympics in London. Believe it or not, yachtsman Paul Elstrom is still an Olympian 40 years later. Here's Gary Jobson with more. Ahmad, there's always questions in every sport. Who is the greatest? In football, was it Jimmy Brown or Walter Payton? In basketball, Bob Cousy or Larry Bird? But in sailing, there's no question at all. Paul Elstrom from Denmark sailed in four different Olympic games and won four gold medals. His first was in 1948. Forty years later, he's here in Pusan competing. Let's spend a moment in time with Paul Elstrom. Ask the best sailors in the world who the best sailor in the world is. Chances are they'll say he's a white-haired, ancient mariner from Copenhagen who's won four Olympic gold medals, captured 13 world championships in eight different classes of boat, and is now competing in his ninth Olympic Games, the legendary Paul Elvstrom. I'm 60 years old, so I think it's my last Olympics. So it's the ninth time I have been in the Olympics. But I say it the same after Los Angeles. So we never know. <laughs> I am sailing. I am sailing home again across the sea. His phenomenal Olympic success began in 1948 in the Finn class, a one-man dinghy in which he was his own captain, his own crew, and ultimately his own worst enemy. His four consecutive gold medals going it alone, his solitary obsession with perfection finally took its toll. At the 1972 games in Germany, he suffered a nervous breakdown. It was awful, and I thought I would never be able to sail again. And, um, but I started again with my daughter, 
and uh, were sailing in Los Angeles where we came forth in the tornado class, the fastest of all the Olympic classes. It's a really a dream to sail with her and she's very fast and um, we are so used to each other that when we are sailing we don't talk very much because I know what she's doing, she knows what I'm doing. Our relationship has changed since we started to sail together because we're very much together. And it's, uh, we have a very good relationship, father and daughter. We, we talk about a lot of things. Trina Elvstrom owns a chic clothing boutique just down the street from her father's house and sees more of him now than when she was growing up. Those days he spent most of his time away from home. Once alone in success, now he shares. Today, now I'm sailing 100% for fun. His annual trip south from Denmark to the Caribbean has been part of the healing process. Once unable to share his passion for sailing with anyone, it's now a family affair. Sailing is, was, and is my life. Elvstrom now spends much more time in Copenhagen in the house where he was born 60 years ago, tending to his Olympic catamaran. With age, his theme is not to slow down. Now, uh, when, when I'm older, I like faster and faster boats. And that's the reason I'm sailing catamaran. But even we are not winning, we have fun. And the main thing is to uh, compete. And I'm very happy to be able to compete. But it's more fun when we are winning. That's for sure. take a look at Paul Elstrom and the other sailors in race number three in a moment. Welcome back to the Pusan Yachting Center for race number three. The sailing conditions on the waters off Pusan have been rough for each of the first three races. Paul Elstrom and his daughter took off in a fast start crossing ahead of the fleet on Port Tack. It was a daring move that only the master could make. But later on in the race, they had equipment failure and withdrew. No worries, just another day of sailing for Paul and his daughter. Americans Allison Jolly and Lynn Jewell were way behind at the start in the women's 470 class. But they turned on the afterburners. They found fresh wind and sailed flawlessly to take the lead at the second mark. Other teams had problems with twisted sails. The Americans continued to stretch their lead. They never looked back. They are very comfortable in these conditions. Uh, this is our kind of stuff, wind-wise. This is just perfect for us. Power up, you know, wind's wearing bottles and, uh, you know, water weight. And it's just right for our, our weight conditions. So how do you feel with four races to go? Well, I wouldn't want to trade places with anyone out there, but uh, there's still a lot, a lot of races there. Yeah. There is also royalty participating here. 18-year-old Princess Christina is an alternate on the Spanish team. Her mother, Queen Sophia, is a proud parent. In the star class, Mark Reynolds sailed fast today. In race one, he had an eighth. Race two, a fourth. Early on in the race, he was behind but he sailed well in the waves and found some favorable wind. At the finish, he was first. I think we're learning a lot, and we, uh, we had a lot of help from guys that were here last year and kind of putting that together with what we get from our meteorologist. Uh, I think we're starting to learn a little bit about what's going on, but you know, tomorrow will probably be different. Coaching is the lifeblood of many sports. Coaches like John Thompson are involved in every second of play. On the water, it's different. Coaches must sit and watch, but they can still help. Similar to football or basketball, sailing is a game of fundamentals. You know, the, the tacking has to be right, the boat speed has to be right, jibing, all the moves are very important. And we work very hard with our guys to make sure they practice those things, work hard on those things. We look at sail selection. We spend two weeks in L.A. looking at rig tuning, all the kind of things that are fundamental to making a sailboat go fast. The single-handed fin is the most physically demanding of the Olympic classes. The American entry is U.S. Naval Officer Brian Ledbetter, who has been struggling. Right now, I think I just need to get off the line, stay loose, and look at it as a four-race series, no throwouts. 
and uh, go out there and do the best I can. Mike Gebhardt never emerged from the pack in the sailboard class and finished 11. New Zealand won the race. Americans John Shatton and Charlie McKee started fast in the men's 470 division and sailed in second place all the way to the finish. For the second day in a row, the big story in this class was the controversy surrounding the Torton brothers from Israel. They violated Israeli team policy by competing on the Jewish holy day, Yom Kippur. The Tartans withdrew from the race just before finishing and they were not scored, but they have been told to stay on shore. The brothers continue to sail, but they will not travel to Seoul for the closing ceremonies and their fate will be decided after they return home by an Israeli athletic committee. In the tornado class, Pete Melvin had equipment problems. The female part of the rotation thing, this goes on here, rolls around, that fits up in there, and it, they, uh, it's it's shattered. The casting shattered. Look at it's that. Casting shattered. San Francisco sailor John Kosecki never found clear wind today and finished well back in fifth. Oh, what a feeling. East Germany was first in this race, but Kosecki still leads. It's just about 6.30 in the morning here in Seoul, and as you can see, the markets are already busy. We'll return with more coverage of the games of the 24th Olympiad right after this. If you were with us yesterday, you know that I'm keeping a video diary during the course of these games, the highlights of my stay in Seoul. Now, yesterday, you know, I had a big choice. Either I could have picked the tailor that made the suit for Lingaberta Humpledunkle, or I could have picked Jimmy the tailor, who is the finest tailor here in Itaewon. And Jimmy is here with my blazer. Jimmy, come on, come on up. This is Jimmy. How are you? How are you? Nice yes. to see you this morning. Jimmy, would you like a donut, maybe? Uh, no, thank you. No? Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, now, do you have my blazer? Oh, not. Because uh, you're not choice the right material, the right color. I wanted the blue with the polyester blue with the patch on it. Well, uh, you're not call me back again. I just wait for you to, to call me one phone. Oh, I had to call you, yeah. but now 24 hours. Uh, right. So, so now, if you make it, it's, now you know what I want, the polyester with the patch. Can you have it here tomorrow, 24 hours? Sure, I can. No it. problem. No problem. Uh, now, one thing I forgot to give you, which may speed up oh. to deliver this jacket, was some no, money no, I didn't pay you. No, that's not a reason. Okay. It's because I can make it uh, 24 hours to get for you and blazer tomorrow. Okay, tomorrow we'll have it here on the show. Same time? Yes. All right, Jimmy, thanks for coming by. Sure. All right. In today's Soul Searching installment, I get my first big break, and television may never be the same. At 8 o'clock on Tuesday nights, millions of TV viewers tune in to Diary of a Farm Family, Korea's most popular primetime soap. You won't find high-powered multi-millionaires like the Carringtons or the Ewings on this series, but one of the stars of Diary of a Farm Family, Kim Hae-ja, says her show is similar to another American series. The show chronicles the lives of the Kims, a poor rural farm family. The patriarch is Choi bul -Om. Choi says the series, which has been running on the Moonwa network for eight years, has remained popular because it reminds Koreans of their past, a time when most Koreans made their living as farmers. But while many viewers can relate to the Kims, there's one major difference that separates a TV family from the average Korean household. The Kim family has adopted a child. In real life, adoption is not widely accepted. I take pride in that the entire family is still together. But even though there are two sons on the show, you have adopted another son. I really take a pride in this TV family. While the soap operas in the U.S. and Korea may seem worlds apart, there are similarities. Just like the stars in America, these stars for millions of fans become the characters they play. When you walk down the street, people think that they're actually the character on the show. Does that happen to you? In the cities, they seem to know my real name. But in the rural areas and on the farms, they really think that I'm that role. After watching some of the taping of the series, the producers 
decided to give me a special guest appearance on the show. But how does an American sports announcer fit into a Korean drama? Pretty stylish. <laughs> now I do look like Father Murphy. After the makeup, the director gave me a few last-minute tips on Korean. What does this one say? Uh, smile. Smile. <laughs> we gave up on the costume idea, but I was ready for my debut on Korean TV. <laughs> Boy, it is incredible. Since that debut, I can't walk down the street. People are coming up to me, asking me for my autograph. At least I think that's what they're asking me. My agent's phone's been ringing after the hook. And if my wife and child are listening, I'm lying. I'll be home right after the Olympics. We'll be back. This NBC Sports presentation of the games of the 24th Olympiad is brought to you by Kmart. By Cotton Incorporated, the fiber company of America's cotton growers. By Beef Industry Council and Beef Board. Beef, real food for real people. And by Metropolitan Life and affiliated companies. Get met. It pays. The Bulgarians have been dominating the weightlifting competition, but one of their newest world record holders has been stopped by a drug test. Meanwhile, in the 75-kilogram weight class, American Tony Arudia, a metal hope, was having some trouble of his own. Doug Cooney has a weightlifting report. From the weightlifting gymnasium at Olympic Park, it's the middleweight class, 75 kilos, 165 and one quarter pounds in body weight. Hello, I'm Doug Cooney, and as action continues in the 75-kilo weight class, controversy continues to surround the Bulgarian delegation. Mitko Grablov, who won the gold medal for that team in the 56-kilo weight class, has been disqualified for use of an illegal substance. Now, in effect, his gold medal will automatically go to the Soviet entry in that class, Oksan Mirzoyan. Another story we'll be following in this, the 75-kilo weight class, is the American entry, Tony Yurutia. Standing over, 391 and a quarter pounds. He missed the sudden attempt. But what a surprise is Urutia just two months ago lifted 20 pounds more than this. No. And again, Urutia missing. 391 and a quarter pounds. He's in trouble. Boy, everybody here shaking their heads. Tony should be handling this weight much easier. Third attempt. Urutia needs this or he bombs out of the competition. Ooh, pressure's really on Tony. 12 years after his debut at the Olympics in Montreal. Here he goes. Can he complete this lift? 391 and a quarter pounds for Tony Urutia. Stands with some difficulty. Can he get it up the rest of the way? Shaky at the top. But it appears to be a good lift for Tony Urutia. He comes through in the clutch. Gidikoff coming out. 207 and a half kilograms in the bar. 457 and one quarter pounds. If successful, he'll break for the third time the total for the Olympic. Not the world record, the Olympic total. That's what's been set in the Olympics. And if successful, he puts enormous pressure on Varbonov. It'll come right down to the last lift. This could be for the gold right here. He's currently in second, increasing his lead. Correction, he's currently in first. He's increasing that lead over his teammate. Shaking. Ooh, Boris Gidikoff lifting enormous weights here at the Olympics. 207 and a half kilograms, 457 and a quarter pounds. And for the third time, he's broken the Olympic total record. With that lift, Arudia stayed alive but couldn't manage anything heavier and ended the competition in ninth place. The goal went to the Bulgarian Gwidikoff with East German Ingo Steinhoffel getting the silver and Alexander Verbenov of the Soviet Union getting the bronze. We'll be back after some words from your local stations.
River Regatta course, heavy winds delayed the day's racing and left chaos in their wake. The Austrian and American boats collided during warm-ups for the men's pair semifinals. The Austrian boat was demolished and sank. That's the Austrians in the water there. Confusion reigned as the semifinal heats had to be delayed, which jumbled the day's schedule even further, giving the Austrians time to find a new boat. We have to find out. The American boat, meanwhile, was patched up, and the Americans raced courageously in their heat but faded in the final few hundred meters. They had to finish third or better to qualify for the finals. Here they finished fifth, only a boat length behind the third place finisher. Ironically, the Austrian rowers who crashed into the Americans also finished fifth in their heat. It was an afternoon of dashed boats and dashed hopes. Now let's go to the first semifinal of the men's single skulls in America's Andy Suttoth. Bucky Waters with Steve Gladstone inside of 500 meters. Men's single skulls, the first heat. The top three finishers move on to the finals. So far, Lang has dominated the race from East Germany. Suttoth beginning to make a move. In third place, Eric Verdunk of New Zealand. In lane one, Zwoli of Holland, not a factor, nor the Soviet Janssen, nor Posse of Uruguay. It's three boats so far. A good shot of Suttoth, who in the first heat against Lang, brought his boat up at about 250 meters and possibly had a chance to win the heat and seemed indecisive, Steve. Right now, he's moving the boat very, very strongly, and he's giving Thomas Lang something to think about. Verdunk, as well, is not far out of it. If he could put on a strong sprint, he could come back. But Andy Suttoth is moving the boat with real finesse and good power. Suttoth and Lang clearly locked here in a battle. They are psyching each other. Suttoth is not going to let Lang have an easy time. The back pry, the leg drive, the hand work on Suttoth is as fine as it gets. And Lang, right next to him, exhibiting terrific form and power as well. These two could be, Bucky, could be the new forces of sculling in the next generation. The East German Lang looking very cool. Remember, he doesn't have to win this race, but he is beginning slightly to pick up the beat, and Lang it does absolutely that just seems nonplussed and uh he's just stroking Suttoth is making his move Suttoth is driving toward the line but and the he and lang are both driving to the line Suttoth is putting on an excellent sprint lang at this point holding him off this is really fine racing here he comes the length of lang's stroke though very impressive here in the last 50 meters lang one Suttoth two there the key go. now is who is the third boat who will qualify for the finals in this first heat. Hey, a cool tourist there, Andy Suttoth, called by his teammates an aerobic machine, appearing not to be too out of breath, and he did pull on that oar all 2,000 meters. Yes, again, Suttoth proved without any question that he is one of the very, very finest in this league, and he's going to be a force to be reckoned with in the finals. Look this at the leg drive, buck, back pry. His start was not that impressive. He showed us the aerobic conditioning and a great finish. But going into the finals, it's going to have to be a bit better. Yes, it most certainly will be. And he knows what he has to do now. This is what I said. In this heat, people have to show what they have. And you can see Lang driving across the finish line. Not quite a boat length ahead of Suttoth. This is top speed, stop speed sculling. No question about it. Lang and Suttoth are real forces in this division. Here we see Andy relaxing after that heat. He knows what he needs to do in the finals to beat Lang. He must, Bucky, as you said earlier, he must accelerate that boat in that first 30 or 40 strokes. The results of the first semifinal in the men's single skulls. Lang of East Germany first, Suttoth of the United States second, Verdunk of New Zealand third, Posse of Uruguay fourth, Zwoli of Holland fifth, and Janssen of the Soviet Union, sixth. Welcome back to Seoul and more Olympic coverage. Per T. Karpinen has won three consecutive gold medals in the men's single skulls. He won't be winning a fourth. For more, here's Bucky Waters and Steve Gladstone. A thousand meters to go in the semifinals of the men's single skulls. As expected, Peter Michael Koba of West Germany, a fast starter, and he's leading the pace. A surprising Bonitsky of Poland in second, and Karpinen right on the bubble. 
in third place. He has to defend that third place or he won't be able to go for that fourth goal. And right now, Hamish McGlash McGlashan of Australia in lane three is making a move on Karpinen. And there's a very, very interested spectator. Number the second spot in the previous heat, Andy Suddeth, who has qualified for the finals in shades and hat, trying to see who his competition will be. He certainly is. He's more has more than a passing interest here. These are the people that he must race and must beat in order to medal. Harpenden is going to have to keep a keen eye on Hamish McLashen, who is right next to him. That's very fortunate from the draw, Bucky, that Harpenden has McLashen next to him. That way, he will not be surprised. If McLashen drives through him, it's because Harpenden can't do anything about it. Perte Karpinen in his quest for a fourth gold medal is in big trouble in lane two. He is now in fourth place. McGlashan of Australia in lane three is rowing through him. Remember, this is not a race for winners. This is a race for the top three. This could be the end of the dream for Karpinen and the fourth consecutive Olympic gold medal. He must survive this semifinal. Yes, he must survive this final right now. He's looking sluggish. But I've seen this look so often, Bucky, that I'm really reluctant to count this man out. But what I saw in that view was a disheartened, what appeared to be a disheartened Perti Karpinen. But let's not count him out. This is his part of the race. Let's see if he still has it. 500 meters to go. Bucky Waters and Steve Gladstone. Is this the end of an era? Having to finish at least in the top three, Perte Karpinen is buried in fourth. He has less than 500 meters to keep alive his dream of a fourth consecutive Olympic gold medal. Out in front, as expected, Peter Koba of West Germany. That's not important. In second place, Bronjitski of Poland, and that's not important. But right now, the race is between McLashen of Australia and Karpinen of Finland for the vital third place to be able to run for the gold in the finals. Bucky, this is actually a sad sight to see. It's very clear from this view, from the lethargy of his back, from the lethargy of his leg drive, this is the end of Perti Karpinen's dream for a fourth gold medal. Literally, he's paddling his boat in. He's no longer racing. He's out of the race. Buck, I don't know what to say. It's like seeing a great fighter being knocked down. But here, the final three moving toward the finish line, clearly. Peter Michael Kolba in the lead. Perhaps there's just dessert there. This is the man that's been plagued by Carpenter all these years. Now he's out there in front, Carpenter paddling his boat in. Andy Sadath, who made the password to his computer, Carpenter will have to quickly change that between now and the finals. He will not have a chance to dethrone Perte Karpinen, the defending gold medal winner in single skulls over the last three Olympics. He will not be there in the finals. And his competition will come from Koba of West Germany. And I'm not sure it's going to be a photo for two of the next three spots. Yes, too close to call, but surely we see that Peter Koba has qualified. Here he is, paddling his boat, a man to be respected. A sad sight indeed, Bucky. Karpinen, who has tied Ivanov of the Soviet Union for consecutive gold medals and single skulls. Ivanov's record went in 56, 60, and 64. Karpinen in 76, 80, and 84 will not do it in 88. Father Time has made its move. Unless there was an equipment problem or an injury, it's uh, Koba and Karpinen who were 4-4 lifetime in their series. And it was Koba not necessarily putting him out of it because Karpinen only had to finish third. He just didn't have it today, a sad ending. Yes, it sure is. And as I said, here it is, Peter Koba feeling quite, quite good about that finish. The oarsman driving to the line, Koba in lane five with the lead it appears that hamis mcglashan could be in second position broninski close by what's going through his mind how many years he said in a feature he has rode five hours a day for 20 years he is already in the valhalla of rowers and he is in the olympic hall of fame with three consecutive goals 
he almost made it a fourth, tying him with, uh, well, with the gods. The finals in a single skulls are set. Lang of each Germany, Suddeth of the United States, Verdunk of New Zealand will join these three. Koba of West Germany, Maglashen of Australia, Ronitsky of Poland. Down in sixth place, Karpinen, the flying Finn, will not be at the party for the first time in four Olympics. Return to Seoul tonight at 7.30 Eastern Time to bring you live coverage of the games of the 24th Olympiad. Track and Field makes its debut with four of the sport's biggest names in action. Greta Waits in the Women's Marathon. Carl Lewis starts his 100-meter title defense. Jackie joyner Kersey begins the heptathlon. And Edwin Moses runs his first race in the 400-meter hurdles. Plus, women's gymnastics as the all-around women's title is decided. And the USA women's volleyball team plays Brazil. That's all tonight, only on NBC. A final thought on an exciting day. To you, Janet Evans is a heroic Olympic champion. To us here at NBC, she's something of an unexpected dinner guest, although quite a welcome one. You see, Janet is a junk food junkie. Looking for a fix of her usual diet, Janet wandered into one of our NBC cafeterias where she filled up on candy bars and steak. By the way, back home in California, Janet's average meal program includes buttered rolls, chocolate cream pie, donuts, blueberry muffins, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, potato chips, pudding, cookies, burritos, and chocolate milkshakes. She burns that off with 8 to 10 miles a day in the water. So let's take a final look at Janet Evans as she wins the 400-meter freestyle gold medal. I'm Ahmad Rashad. See you tomorrow. Now we come to the final 100 meters, and they are faster than a world record split. The world record holder, Janet Evans, in the dark cap with the American flag swimming just a bit above. Heike Friedrich of East Germany. Maybe a quarter body length lead. Now she extends a little more. They're coming up with 60 meters to swim. In 10 meters, they go to the turn. And the final 50 meters. And here comes Janet Evans to the wall to make the turn for home, going for her second Olympic gold medal. What guts, Don, what guts! A battle all the way that turns out as the coaches thought it would. Evans against Friedrich. Janet Evans, catch her if you can. And in hot pursuit is Heike Friedrich. But now as the race wears on, Janet Evans is putting away the East Germans. They can't stay with her. Janet Evans has put away Anka Mooring in lane five. And fading fast in lane two is Heike Friedrich. Evans is going to go wire to wire. Janet Evans has put away the East German threat. And Janet Evans goes to the wall with a world record time. She smashed a world record and wins Olympic gold for the second time here in Seoul.